Now you probably recognize Benjamin Franklin on that $100 bill and George Washington on your quarter. But let me introduce you to the Buffalo nickel. From 1913 to 1938, this nickel embodied a Native American's face. That face, Chief Big Tree. Not unlike the conversion of Saul to Paul, God radically transformed the path of Big Tree's life from the warrior's road to the Jesus road. But to tell that story, we're going to have to head out west. Iowa. They were fierce warriors that migrated onto the Great Plains, adopting the horse and raiding everywhere across the Southwest. The Kiowa have had a long and tumultuous history, and they soon established themselves as one of the great tribes of the Southwest Plains. The Kiowa are unique because we know more about them in recorded history than almost any other tribe. They weave themselves throughout the history of the West. When we first learned of them, it was in 1804 when Lewis and Clark wintered on the Missouri River. They winter camped with the Kiowa. This painting is a painting of a Kiowa chief. George Catlin painted it. He painted the Kiowa in 1833 while they were camped at their sacred mountain, Rainy Mountain, in southern Oklahoma. Catlin gave us perhaps the best knowledge of the Kiowa before they clashed headlong with the western movement of the frontier. Henry Stanley. He was a reporter for Harper's Weekly who later became famous for finding the lost Dr. Livingston in Africa. Well, in 1867, Stanley recorded the Medicine Lodge Treaty in Kansas. He witnessed the long speeches given by the Kiowa chiefs and he was so taken by Chief Satanta that he made him famous by giving him the moniker, the Orator of the Plains. The whole country came to know the Kiowa as the noble warriors of the plains. Even the Smithsonian, which has the best collection of Native American history, most of their artifacts are from the Kiowa tribe. It really is like God wanted history to notice and record the Kiowa. Remember, this was a very small tribe, perhaps only 2,500 people, but for some reason, they played a huge part in the history of the West. To me, the point is, no one can say the Kiowa were not real Indians. In fact, the Kiowa embodied the very image of the Lord of the Plains. For example, when Theodore Roosevelt commissioned the artist to create an icon of the American West, he had an artist put a portrait of his friend, Kiowa Chief Big Tree, on the head of the Buffalo Nickel. Roosevelt personally knew Big Tree, and in the old days, he had hunted buffalo with him in the Wichita Mountains. The same artist, James Earl Frazier, that designed the Buffalo Nickel, also designed this famous statue. It's called End of the Trail. It depicts the tragedy of the end of the Indian way of life. Let me say it was never God's plan for Native Americans to go through the tragedy, the betrayal, the wars, all the heartbreak and suffering that happened. All along, God had plans for the Native Americans that did not include any of that. God's a good God and He intended for the Native Americans to experience the good news of the gospel that would bring them the freedom that Jesus bought for us all on the cross. Or, as the Kiowa say, the Jesus road. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we read about a story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. It was a showdown of biblical proportions. Well, where we're at today, 
here in the prairies of Oklahoma, you're going to hear about another showdown, a showdown just as dramatic, just as important. It's a story about the Kiowa Indians. In fact, this ground I'm standing on, it still feels sacred when you're here. This mountain behind me, Rainy Mountain, it's where it all began and it's where it's all going to end. In the sacred hills of southern Oklahoma, the Wichita Mountains, among the buffalo and the deer, this was the ancestral home of the Kiowa. One mountain named Rainy Mountain held special significance to the Kiowa. It was always near here that they would hold their annual sun dance. They would meet and plan the year, including where they would raid, who would lead them, and when. In 1871, Chief Big Tree, along with Satanta and Satank, planned to lead a big war party down to Texas. Their goal was to raid along the famous Butterfield Trail that ran between the Army posts. It's 1867 when this building was built here in the plains of Texas, the desolate plains of Texas. This is part, in fact, this is the hospital here at Fort Richardson. But our story today takes us later where a group of Indians lay in wait not too far from here in Salt Creek. Now on this road right out here is the Butterfield Trail. If you don't know what the Butterfield Trail is, it was the main access road between Texas and San Diego, California. So it was widely used. So there's a group of Indians lying in wait. They're going to attack a wagon train. They get word from their medicine man that a wagon train is coming, but there'll be two parties. Who was in the first party? The first party was the famous General Sherman. Now remember, this is after the Civil War. He's a, he's a popular figure. He's bigger than life. So Sherman is coming through, and the reason he's even in this area is to investigate what's happening with all of these Indian sightings and Indian massacres and Indian attacks. So he's here to investigate. The truth is, he felt like it was just a little bit embellished. It wasn't really the truth that he was hearing. So he comes through the Butterfield Trail, the first party. He comes through the Indians lie in wait. Imagine as he goes through a hundred sets of eyes of Indians watching him, he goes through unscathed. A few hours pass, and then finally the second group comes through. Now in this wagon train, the Warren wagon train, they come through, they've got wagon loads of corn, of supplies, horses, mules. This is a gold mine here for the Indians. Well, they circled these wagons. These Indians came together, including one of the ones that we're talking today, Chief Big Tree, and they attack. You've heard the phrase before, wrong place at the wrong time. If ever there was a story that embodied that theme, this was it. This could have been any other ambush, just like any other day. Instead, the destiny of not only Big Tree, but the entire Kiowa Nation would be changed forever by this one decision. Big Tree found himself in the wrong place at the wrong time. We're continuing to follow the trail of Big Tree. You see right behind me, this knoll. That knoll is actually the place right here on the Salt Creek Prairie that Big Tree, all of the Kiowa Indians waited for the wagon train. So as Henry Warren and the 12 wagons came through, they were able to stay there and watch and wait. When they saw them at the right time, they launched out. Full gallop, take over and surround the Henry Warren wagon train. We know what happens. That was the end, but it was the beginning of a new legacy, a new destiny for Big Tree. As survivors began to trickle into the hospital at Fort Richardson, Sherman found out about the raid on his wagon train. He was enraged. The orders were given. Seek out the perpetrators of this vicious attack. It was at a desk just like this that Colonel Ronald McKenzie issued the warrant to go after the Indians involved at the Warren Wagon Train Massacre. 
The men of the 4th U.S. Cavalry under Ronald McKenzie quickly took to the trail. McKenzie and the 4th Cavalry were the old nemesis of the Kiowa. They had chased them from one end of Texas to the other, often ending in pitched battles with neither side getting the upper hand. The Kiowa would always slip away under the cover of darkness. This mission would prove easier than expected. Big Tree's fellow warriors wound up back at Fort Sill. Satanta was heard bragging about the exploits of their raid. Word quickly made its way back to General Sherman. The pride and the audacity of these warriors further enraged the general. He was determined to bring these Kiowa to justice. In a dramatic face-to-face -face showdown on the general's front porch, our warriors were swiftly captured by the general's troops. Big Tree and the other attackers were tried, and for the first time, incarcerated as civilian criminals. After Big Tree was arrested at Fort Sill, he was brought back here to stand trial. He was brought back here to this place I'm standing in. This was his jail cell. One of these small cells was where this Indian who had known nothing but the wild plains of Texas was suddenly in a small jailed cell. You know, the stories we hear is that he actually carved on the side of the wall there an Indian and a horse. Maybe to remember the times that had passed. As he languished here in Fort Richardson, Big Tree's trial only took three days. He was found guilty. And from there, he went to Huntsville to spend out his sentence in the prison there. While Big Tree was in prison in Huntsville, the life of the Kiowa were in turmoil. The Western Plains had changed drastically almost overnight. The Indian Wars had come to an end and the tribes were forced to settle on reservations. It truly was the end of the Indian way of life. After spending time in prison at Fort Richardson in Huntsville, Big Tree is finally paroled and returns home to a very different world from what he remembered, a world he believed would go on forever. Or, as the Medicine Lodge Treaty stated, for as long as the buffalo roamed the prairies. Well, even the buffalo were now gone. The tribe's horses had been destroyed, and even the reservation itself was broken up into individual allotments. With the opening of these reservations, a renewed missions movement sparked in the church. Because the Wichita Mountains have long been held sacred amongst the Kiowa, and Rainy Mountain in particular, the missionary societies began to send missionaries there. They began to build missions at Rainy Mountain. that uh, the Kiowas loved their missionaries. They took them in. And Marietta Reside, who was the first missionary, who came with them, and her, her uh, helper, Loretta Ballou, who was Cherokee. And uh, they gave uh, Marietta Reside uh, the Kiowa name of Aim de Cole which means she's pointing them to the path and she's telling them to come this way. And so they called her Aim de Cole. And then her, her helper, Loretta uh, Ballou, the, they gave her the name of Matema, which means teacher. And so Kiowas gave, uh, well, Kiowas gave most of their, all of their missionaries Kiowa names because it was much better to call them by in Kiowa than for them. And to me, it was real. I'm sure they considered it an honor. And Miss Risa did understand Kiowa. She, she learned Kiowa. She, she understood Kiowa. And so I think that helped her a lot. And then helped the Kiowas. It, was, it worked both ways. Of course, uh, they accepted her. So they accepted and loved all their missionaries.
The children of the tribe now attended school. They learned to adopt the white man's way of life. Now, can you imagine what Big Tree must be feeling? Returning from years in prison to find his entire world had completely changed. Worst of all, one of the first converts of Rainy Mountain was Big Tree's wife, her own brother, Tonakoi, fearsome medicine man of the tribe. He was furious too. I'm sure Big Tree just wandered around his tribe for days in wide-eyed disbelief, trying to see if he could find any sense of normality. His wife, his people, even one of his closest friends, Sanko, had now taken up this Jesus road. These once proud hunters were now forced into farming. These once fierce warriors were now living in enforced peace. He didn't understand about this new road, this Jesus road. He understood the road the medicine man had taught. He understood about sun dancing and about being a warrior. This Jesus road, he didn't understand. He knew there was power in the old ways. Big Tree knew the gods the medicine man taught. He earnestly continued searching for his place in this new world. One day, Big Tree was sitting around with his fellow former warriors in a field when Tonakoi, the tribe's medicine man, rode in on his horse. Tonakoi stood and said, Sanko, I'm going to warn you for the last time. Give up that white man's God. Quit that business entirely. Return to the Indian Wayne. Do you get what I made? Sanko replied, let me read it right here from the book. I have taken the Jesus road it is a good road. When I take up a new road, I keep it. The Jesus road is kindness. It says to love your brother, which we Indians have always known was good. The white God is the great spirit. He loves us all. I believe in his medicine. I have taken it close to my heart and I will hold it fast. Do you want to live long, says Tonakoi? I but do, I but I'm not afraid to die. I am not afraid, am not afraid of your medicine. In that case, said Tonakoi furiously, you better dig your grave. You're not going to live more than two days. I'll see to that. Big Tree understood he was seeing what was shaping up to be a showdown of the gods. Well, of course, Sanko kind of panics a little bit. He's a new believer. He doesn't know what to think. This spreads throughout the tribe and everything, and so he comes to the church here. Now, we're in the Rainy Mountain Baptist Church. This is not the original building, but this is the original site right. of where they the building... Right, burned down in the 40s. Yeah, it burned down, so they rebuilt it here. But this is where he came, and he came to get reassurance from the missionary. Now, that missionary, remember, she is being the one, again to bring the gospel. Sanko went to Marietta Reside, the missionary who led him to the Lord. He implored her, what do I do? At first, Marietta didn't take the threat seriously. Her interpreter explained to her just how serious this was. Her interpreter's brother, the son of a powerful chief, had been one that was killed by Tonakoi, the medicine man. This was indeed serious business. Marietta advised Sanko to use the most powerful weapon a believer has, prayer. They joined in together and their prayers filled the room. A hushed anointing filled that place. Finally, Marietta said to Sanko, it is finished, go in peace. It was on a mountain where God made man. It was on that same mountain God chose to reveal himself to Abraham and to place his name and have his temple built. Throughout history, man has sought for God on mountaintops, and the devil has used mountaintops as a place for his counterfeit gods. Anything God does, the devil tries to pervert. Now, it was no surprise to anyone when Tonakoi chose the sacred mountain as the scene of the showdown. Once again, we go back to Rainy Mountain. The sound emerged slowly. 
the foreboding repetition of the drum beat. The echo permeated the plains as the sun set over the sacred rainy mountain. Ominous shadows danced about the walls of the medicine teepee. A bonfire directly outside its entrance was lit. Tonight, it had been promised, true power would be revealed. The gods of the Kiowa, they were promised, were to be summoned to strike down this follower of Jesus, this Jesus who was being touted as the one true God. As the drums continued, Tonakoi's wife stood on either side of the teepee. Beside the fire was the dirt effigy of a man, lying on his back with his arms outstretched. The figure was fashioned from dirt and in the chest, a heart-shaped hole about six inches deep. Struggling to remain stoic, Sanko fought down fear as he and every person there knew who was represented by that figure. They had seen Tonakoi kill or drive men mad. He struggled not to remember others before him that had died. Suddenly the booming of the tribal drums could be heard. From out of the teepee, a grotesque figure appeared and leapt to the front and stood full in the light of the fire. It was Tonakoi in his ritualistic medicine man paint and regalia. Tonakoi had brought everything he ever used to destroy his enemies. This was a war he intended to win. The eagle claw in his hand assured victory as he began the dance. He would brush his victim's victory away. His warlike chant and medicine man coup stick was fearsome, holding the scalps of the first two enemies. Death stood there as he danced in his warlike vengeance dance. No warrior wanted to draw Tonakoi's attention. The chants of the songs could be heard as Tonakoi moved in the supposed power of his gods. With great care, he paused, picked up a metal dipper, scooped up hot coals from the fire, and with the teeth bared in a parody of a smile, he poured them into the heart of the effigy. Sanko felt an agonizing pain in his chest and leaned over. At this point, Tonakoi began the dreaded death prayer. His arms outstretched, he prayed to the south, the west, the north, and the east in succession. At the very climax, Tonakoi grabbed his Winchester, pointed it at the heart of the effigy, and fired. Time seemed to stand still. As the echoes of the shot died away, the medicine man, Tonakoi, this powerful shaman of all the old ways, clutched his stomach and fell down in the dirt. Before anyone else could move, the two wives rushed in and turned the man over. His fading gasp of air came more slowly. Then they stopped. Tonakoi was dead. The people remained in place staring. They were stunned seeing the body of the vanquished shaman. The silence was broken by the loud wailing of his wives. Yet during all of the commotion, Sanko was forgotten. Sanko gained new courage. He stood up straight and tall. He was filled with awe and wonder. He was alive. Sanko made his way up the little slope and looked down at Tonakoi's lifeless body. Sanko lifted his arms in the heavens and shouted, my God wins. My God wins. Big Tree recognized the power of what he had just seen. The Christian God had shown his might. The man whose evil had killed so many was himself vanquished. Sanko's faith in the one true God had saved him from the dark power of Tonakoi. Well, needless to say, the next Sunday, church was full. Big Tree and the other tribal leaders took up the Jesus Road with the same Kiowa passion they had once used to walk the warrior road. To this day, this sacred mountain that for many generations was a place where the Kiowa sought for God was the very place the Great Spirit chose to show himself strong and to call the Kiowa his people. This truly is a story of biblical proportions. Another thing that I've carried through in my, my mind and my heart through the years is the first Kiowa hymn was sung at Rainy Mountain. On the dark, keep us safe. 
Alleluia, people said, Jesus, Alleluia, people said, Jesus, Alleluia, on the sick, take a cover, people said. Jesus, on the sick, beg it on, keep on sick. And then the translation I'll give is, who is it that came from heaven? The briefly, and it's Jesus. And why did he come? He came to save all people. He came to live in man's heart. This story is really the same story we see repeated over and over in the Word. God calls out a people to worship Him. The legacy of faith is a crown of honor to the Kiowa people. Today you can feel it in their churches. You can see it in the names of their early church fathers who were once warriors but became Sunday school teachers and deacons. You can hear it in their songs. The Kiowa legacy includes great patriots who've received the Medal of Honor and writers who have received the Pulitzer Prize being intellectuals and men of science. The Kiowa are a proud people with a huge heritage of faith. To this day, they are traveling the Jesus road. If ever there was a be the one story, it's this story that includes both the missionaries and the brave Kiowa who saw in Jesus a personal savior and a way of living for their people, a Jesus road. Well, one of the things that we discovered in all the research is there's so many different variations on the same story. So it was important to get the facts right. And while this program took much longer than normal to produce because it took a long time to make sure you had the story accurate, Too often we see this time period in history depicted as the white man versus the Native American. But that wasn't this story at all. This was Native American versus Native American. Good medicine versus bad medicine. This was a standoff from within. We had a full cast of Native Americans and they were amazing because they brought, in many cases, their own sets. Some of our regalia went back to the 1920s. The American Indians, and specifically the Kiowa, were very, very spiritual. The Kiowa people, when they took up the faith in Jesus, they said, we're going down the Jesus road. They coined that phrase. When they gained the Jesus road, they also gained means and ways to be able to not only survive, but do very well. The people that speak the loudest to us as Christians are the ones that were the most human, but rose above the circumstances of life and let God work something out miraculous. That's inspiring in the body of Christ. That's what we strive for today as the church. And we see it right here in these humble beginnings from one transformation to the whole tribe going and pushing towards Jesus.